We'll be start. We'll be starting in just a minute or two, uh, as people are joining at a pretty fast clip right now. Okay, welcome again. Uh, glad you have returned or glad you've joined us for the first time uh, for this uh, day two of the third workshop in the road to recovery. Uh, I thought yesterday was a, a great foundation for and a building block for what we're gonna do today and then again tomorrow. And that is continue to explore how we can move forward in the recovery of birds um, I'm excited to hear some of the recovery stories today with the lessons learned associated with that so that we can all gain from their experience. We'll start this morning with some, uh, a model under the Endangered Species Act and then move to uh, the species working groups uh, in birds in the afternoon and have a little transition in the middle of that to kind of further go into the road to recovery. I want to thank uh, the sponsors for this, uh, the uh, putting, helping to put on this workshop, the American Ornithological Society, Partners in Flight, NABSI, and in particular, the Knobloch Family Foundation. Um, we have a host of people, individuals to thank for getting us here in terms of the organizing committee and the planning committee associated with this workshop. There they are displayed and they represent a full suite of organizations across the, actually the continent. And now for a little bit of uh, reminders of the logistics and the kind of uh, the way we're gonna conduct it today. Again, we have uh, dis disabled the attendee to attendee chat. You can use um, the, the Padlet, the workshop Padlet that will uh, show up in, in the chat as a link today. That, and that's for comments. So that if you have comments to make about the workshop or um, improvements we can make or, or any, any kind of comments that you might have, you're welcome to put that. It's organized uh, by subjects in, in the Padlet. Um, we want you to focus on the Q&A button at the bottom. That's a, your opportunity to use it for questions, questions only, or, uh, so that we can sort through your questions and pull them up for the panelists during the panel time. And as we did yesterday, we do have closed captions so uh, that you can follow along that way as well. I think um, with that, I will introduce our, our moderator for this morning, and it's Sarah Kendrick. Sarah is the state ornithologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Sarah works with the state conservation partners to coordinate the Missouri Bird Conservation Plan, which acts as a reference to public and private land managers to promote bird habitat management and outreach for Missouri's most threatened species. Sarah coordinates bird monitoring on the priority lands in Missouri. She oversees the, the re reintroduction of the brown-headed nuthatch to Missouri, supports full life cycle conservation efforts by the Southern Wings program and Partners in Flight, and works to educate Missouri citizenry on the three billion birds decline and what they can do about it. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Paul. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending day two, um, the best session of the whole Road to Recovery webinar. Just joking. Um, so I personally enjoy being part, I've been part of the Road to Recovery group 
um, with all the great participants you saw a few slides ago. So I enjoy being part of this group um, over this time because it really bends my brain in a, in a good way. So I work at a state agency, so ecosystem management is generally our approach. And I must admit that being part of the Road to Recovery group and discussing single species recovery initially threw me for a loop. Um, but I've also never worked with endangered species, which either makes me a terrible moderator for the session or a great one. I'm not sure. You'll have to decide that on your own. But through discussions with Road to Recovery and its different and so diverse perspectives, I've learned a lot about the need to focus on single species to learn the causes of their declines in order to turn that around to prevent listing and further decline. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as Paul mentioned yesterday, single species is not the only way, but it's one essential piece of focused recovery. And I think that you'll find in listening to these presentations today that once we get to the implementation piece, that focus uh, does get broader. And we'll hear more about that from, from various speakers. So in this morning session, we're focusing on the road to recovery process and what that means. Yesterday, we heard compelling information that will only help to mold and form this road to recovery process that we'll delve into today. So we learned yesterday about co-production and what that means, and it's important in making recovery efforts as collaborative, strong, adaptable, and sustainable as possible with diverse non-traditional partners, and how important it is to reach out to these audiences to gather those various perspectives of communities, conservation partners, and the general public that we may not at first blush consider. We heard about social science and its ability to inform more effective messages by integrating human concerns and values into conservation decisions and how that only helps, well, sometimes <laughs> it helps a lot. And we heard from communications experts with examples and really good discussion about folding in those communications efforts to help us spread our messages and also to inspire calls to action and that cooperation that we need. So today we're going to learn from the experts from those who have worked on targeted species recovery and what they've learned along their paths and how different those paths are. So in this morning session, we'll hear more about the road recovery process from Ken Rosenberg and Fabiola Rodriguez, and then from four professionals who've been deeply involved for many years in this focused species recovery, whether endangered species or threatened. So after that, we'll have a panel discussion. And today we really hope to glean some of those lessons learned and advice for the road to recovery process moving forward. So please feel free again to enter your questions in the Q&A, both for speakers during their presentations. We'll try, <clears throat> we'll try to get to one or two of those after their talks if we have time. And also enter questions during their panel discussion and we will get to those. So I'll introduce our first speakers, Ken Rosenberg and Fabiola Rodriguez. Ken Rosenberg is the Applied Conservation Scientist at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology with a joint position at American Bird Conservancy. Ken was the lead author on the decline of the North American Avifauna publication in Science in September 2019, and he helped develop and launch the Road to Recovery Initiative as part of the coordinated response to three billion birds lost. Fabiola Rodriguez is a PhD candidate at Tulane University, where she studies ecology of overwintering migratory birds in Honduras. She's currently the Road to Recovery Fellow and assists the initiative in the coordination of the recovery process for birds. Her goal with Road to Recovery is to contribute her insight on the neotropical non-breeding grounds perspective into the recovery process. So we'll be hearing from Ken and Fabi about the Road to Recovery process. Ken, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And I also wanna take this opportunity to thank all the presenters, panelists, participants who've joined us on this journey on the road to recovery. So in this talk, we're gonna briefly review where we've been with the road to recovery process, where we're hoping to go after learning about um, all these human dimensions concepts of bird conservation in this workshop. So, for those of us who've been at this bird conservation game for a long time, the concepts we heard about yesterday might seem new or even make some of us uncomfortable. Or if they're not new, we, we still haven't really done a good job incorporating these ideas into the way we work. And I wanna emphasize that this is an exploratory process as others have said, we don't really have the answers yet. And the work of developing this process of sustainable species recovery is going to continue after this workshop, of course. So, um, next slide. Um, so, first, a reminder of the three main goals of the Road to Recovery Initiative why we're here. 
The first is to develop this process and garner the resources necessary to support a new process for sustainable species recovery, starting with species on the brink of becoming endangered. So that's what this workshop is about. For non-listed species, the working groups and initiatives that have formed are largely led by volunteers who, who do this important work in and around their day jobs, often without much financial or other support. And this is one of the things that we're hoping will change. So we'll hear today from some recovery teams that have operated under the Endangered Species Act to glean aspects of that approach that we might be able to adapt to the many species that need recovery but do not yet have those kinds of, of resources. And we'll hear lessons from some initiatives like the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group that's been at this for nearly two decades. And we're, we're looking forward to hearing those insights. So um, the second goal is to promote targeted and actionable science which includes both biological and social science to recover bird populations. And our third goal is to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of implementation by eliminating this gap between science and implementation that we heard uh, so much about yesterday. Okay, next slide. Um, another reminder is that our focus is on recovering bird populations. And this is not necessarily the same as management or conservation of habitats or addressing broad threats to birds. And again, we need to know exactly what is limiting each population, where and when that limitation is acting in order to be more targeted in our management. And we still don't know that for the majority of the species we're concerned about here. And this work of understanding the causes of bird decline still needs to happen on a species by species basis, as Sarah has uh, just indicated, because even species in the same habitats have different biology or under different threats throughout their annual cycle. Even if the conservation strategies that we end up implementing are across multiple species or even ecosystems. And this focus on recovery has usually been reserved for endangered or threatened species that have these legal mandates under the ESA or, or other acts. So what we're really saying now is that this concept of recovery with recovery teams and plans and much greater levels of funding and other support is what needs to happen proactively for steeply declining species that are on the brink of becoming endangered or we're gonna end up with many more listed species and losing billions more birds. Next slide. So our approach so far has involved deciding which species to focus on first using these new metrics of urgency based on recent species trend analyses. And we spent a lot of time on this already um, on the targeted research filling critical knowledge gaps to determine limiting factors, figuring out how to collect the data we need, and then advancing each species through a set of replicable and measurable steps to develop a strategy for species recovery. And this third workshop, we're, we're focusing on that process for developing those recovery strategies. Next slide. And this is the pyramid model that we developed, the pyramid scheme, as some have called it. Um, to describe the road to recovery process, identifying specific steps towards understanding limiting factors, identifying conservation strategies to address those limiting factors. And each species is at a different stage in this process, ranging from species like evening grosbeak that's lost 90% of its population and we don't even know why it's declining to um, bird like Kirtland's warbler, which is in recovery now and has recently been removed from the endangered species list. We're gonna hear more about some of these species in today's sessions. So until now, this pyramid has focused primarily on the biological science needed to advance our knowledge of these species in order to stop and reverse declines. And that's been the focus of the previous two workshops we held in July and December. Next slide. But as we learned so poignantly uh, from Ashley and others yesterday, bird conservation and species recovery will not be successful without considering the needs and values of people. 
from policymakers, land managers, food producers, and consumers, people who might be contributing to habitat loss and other threats to birds, and people who are the stakeholders in the recovery process we're trying to create. And we know that there's this entire field of conservation social science with many experts focused on this human side of conservation. And that's, and that's what we're trying to draw from here. And that's why we're focusing this third workshop on social science, co-production models, and communications, um, as we all heard about yesterday. Next slide. So the challenge then is how do we incorporate these human dimensions into the species recovery process? How do we apply these broad concepts of social science, co-production, um, communications? Um, re so recovery has two components. It's an intersection between the biological and social science that's necessary not only to eliminate the implementation gap, but also to make recovery sustainable in the long run. So as we thought more about this pyramid model, we realized that as you get closer to recovery on the biological side, the work necessary to incorporate human dimensions gets larger and larger. And that last step going from six to seven in our pyramid is where most of the conservation work actually takes place. So we really need maybe two pyramids, but even this doesn't really reflect the interconnectedness between each step. So we're looking for a simpler yet more integrated model. And as we hear from the various species working groups later today, including the recovery process for already listed species, we wanna focus on these non-biological science concepts to see what, what's been working, what might be improved. And again, emphasize that we're just in this exploratory phase and with this workshop, we're just trying to understand the best way that these human dimensions concepts can be incorporated into the road to recovery. So having new perspectives is really important to figure out how to make all this work. And Fabi is the, the newest member of our Road to Recovery team. And she's gonna now present um, our newest thinking of, about a model for Road to Recovery in a way that integrates both the biological and social science components at each step in the process. So I will turn it over to Fabi now. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Ken, for this uh, transition. So from this point forward, we will be uh, looking at the road to recovery uh, and how we can challenge ourselves to think about incorporating the social sciences and the biological sciences in parallel. So emphasizing that it is not a finished product and that we're learning through this workshop how to best do this. So let's... Um, Take it and move along. During the first phase, assessing and learning, we're really collecting baseline information. And we need to think back to the trigger of the road to recovery process, and that is identifying a species as a priority. Is a species in steep decline? Is a species in need of recovery? As an example, with the evening grow speak, one of the steps along this way is to fill biological and social science knowledge gaps. So taking this species, filling or understanding the knowledge gaps for the species on the biological side looks like, do we know what the threats are causing the decline? Um, likely we know the distribution, but do we know where most members of the population spend the different parts of their life cycle? And a social science knowledge gap that we can begin filling at this early phase is identifying the different conservation partners that could be involved in the process. All of this would be centralized in a database. And last year, Road to Recovery launched a, a database to collect this data. Currently, it's being revised. And with the learned experiences from this workshop, we hope to add fields in the social science knowledge gaps that we need to look out for. So now that we know what the gaps are and we want to fill them, we also need to think about how to fill them. And this is where co-production comes in. Yesterday, we learned that in summary, co-production is this active collaboration among different conservation partners. And from comments in the chat from participants, we need to also challenge ourselves to think about non-traditional conservation partners, including those groups and peoples that could be impacted by the conservation strategies for recovery. So once we 
collaborate with the different partners, identify a plan to even come up with the research questions on the biological side, we would be working actively to fill gaps in migratory connectivity, linked populations, in summary, topics that were covered in the previous two workshops. All of this data is valuable in the recovery process because we would like to pinpoint where populations are most limited and where work needs to be prioritized. In parallel, the social science work can continue and deepen our understanding of, for example, for the tree swallow, how does the social economical interest, values, and perspectives of people vary across a range that is so large geographically. We need to think about integrating cultural perspectives. So we will never learn everything we need to know, but there will be a point where it's enough to move to phase two, the planning and designing. And the co-production here must continue to synthesize and identify the limiting factors alongside with conservation strategies for the recovery of the bird populations. So say the biological science um, under, uh, discovered or revealed that habitat loss is what we need to tackle for countering the declines. And then through social science exercises, we know that in that landscape where habitat is crucial, the activities that change it are agricultural or urbanization. But here, we can also think how social science can be even more critical to help us understand what is driving um, these uh, choices in the landscape that are made by people. So through the co-production process, we could arrive to a strategy, a plan um, that puts in place the actions that need to be done, but also we propose the feasibilities of those actions at different parts of the full annual cycle. Because Likely through the co-production process, we will discover where do we need to build stronger partnerships. And this is a perfect opportunity to remind everyone that this isn't a linear process. There are feedbacks everywhere, and we'll likely even discover new knowledge gaps that we need to work on and better inform the process. But if co-production was strong at the beginning, we hypothesize that then the piloting and implementation step would be done more smoothly. Um, so to eliminate the implementation gap. And this is the action on the ground um, phase. And for this, I want to bring an example that I learned from yesterday uh, during Dr. Jessica Barnes' talk on co-production in the context of the Conservation Reserve Program or CRP. For those of you who do not know, that program in the United States incentivizes landowners to convert croplands to grasslands. And so if you think about this scenario, the actions on the ground could meld the biological science and the social science as well. On the biological side, um, we're worried about how much habitat will we need to hit a population target? What are the characteristics in the landscape of this habitat? And on the social science, we need those actions that help us gain and sustain support from, in this case, those landowners. And we would arrive to a final phase of monitoring and evaluating. Not to say that evaluation does not occur or cannot and should not occur in previous phases, but in this phase, it's particularly important because ultimately we want to be critical and evaluate if the actions that we did help the bird populations. Remember, that was the trigger, the recovery of the bird populations. And then we also need to think about our social science strategies. And if we think about them in this context of the bird populations, were these supportive of the bird um, conservation strategies? So in the case of the landowner example I mentioned previously, did the social strategies achieve more support, a change in attitude, etc. There could be multiple examples, and these are going to vary by species. And again, we don't have the answers. But we can also evaluate both the biological science and the social science strategies in the context of are we doing it in the right way, in a more, uh, in a way that considers people's values, well-being, and perspectives. And I want to emphasize again how for species that uh, have a distribution that is more global, we really need to keep this at the core of our planning and our co-production process. So to start closing this presentation, I have to bring back important messages. One, 
that this is an exploratory process. And through this workshop, we're trying to challenge ourselves of how to, or train ourselves as biologists, how to always think about the social sciences along the way. The other take home messages are, remember the drivers of the process, recovery of bird populations, eliminating the implementation gap, and getting at that sustained recovery of those populations. I think that those are the main messages. And I invite you to stay today and tomorrow to hear from multiple working groups, conservation efforts, initiatives. Um, we're going to learn how they have thought or acted upon these uh, disciplines of social science, co-production, communications, what, the, what are their challenges, and what they foresee as the next steps. The social, this also will span across the United States borders, so we can learn from different perspectives and realities. Um, we'll hear from recovery teams. And yes, to support Sarah, this may be the one of the better, one of the best days, but no, just kidding too. Um, so we don't have time for questions and I will invite you to go to the Padlet to give us your comments under the column of R2R our pyramid process. Um, we do, and we will have an open forum at the end of tomorrow's uh, day. If you have questions about the road to recovery process, I invite you um, and I invite critical critical input and critical questions because I believe that that is how uh, we get we get better. So without any further things to add, I want to thank everyone for their time and I will give it back to Sarah. Thanks, Bobby, and thanks, Ken. I appreciate it very much. We, we do have a few minutes before we move into the other presentations, and we did have one question that I think is really important to address before we move forward for the rest of the day. So um, we had a question. Uh, the panelists uses the terms conservation and recovery very frequently and seem to be using these terms interchangeably. So, and how are these terms defined? And so I will turn it over to Ken, if you can turn on your video and just give kind of that definition or thought of how we're using those terms in the road to recovery from a road to recovery perspective. And then Michelle Shaughnessy and the next endangered species presentation will give more um, definitions of these terms from an ESA perspective. So Ken. Yeah, well, that's a good question. And I know we, we've been kind of training ourselves to shift the wording We've been talking about conservation for 30 years and, and we really haven't been talking about recovery for these non-endangered species. And there's some, um, well, I don't know if everybody saw those in the chat or just we did. Uh, so I think, yeah, Michelle and, and the panel coming up will inform us on what these terms mean from a legal standpoint. And, um, and, and essentially, you know, recovering a population that's already endangered basically means that it's no longer needed, uh, that the listing requirement is no longer needed. And so since, so I don't know that we've actually thought about what, what an exact definition would be for something, you know, when is an evening growth speak recovered if it's lost 90% of its population? Now, I know Partners in Flight and other initiatives have spent a lot of time thinking about what are realistic population objectives. And there's a whole process for setting those objectives and trying to meet those objectives. Um, and there's been debates, you know, as to what kind of baseline we, we really can use. You know, we, we know we can't restore all birds to 1970 populations. So I would say, uh, you wanted me to have a brilliant answer, but I don't really have one because I would say that's still an open question, but, by focusing on the actual causes of decline and, and in the, the actual demographic factors causing mortality or, or lack of reproductive capacity, we, that's what we wanna turn around. And we wanna, we wanna have a positive trajectory and we wanna get these birds off of the trajectory that's taking them down into endangered status. So at least that's what I think of right now as recovery is to reverse these declines and get them off of that trajectory. And at, to what level we can actually recover them to, that's still uh, an open question in my mind. Great, thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. Okay, so now we're gonna pivot to our endangered species, endangered and threatened species stories. Uh, but first we'll hear from Michelle Shaughnessy with US Fish and Wildlife Service about ESA recovery teams. Um, we'll hear from her perspective on targeted recovery from an agency perspective and also what she has found uh, to work well that oversees these recovery plans. So 
Michelle Shaughnessy has been with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 27 years, working on a variety of endangered species issues in different roles and positions throughout the country. She has been involved in on the ground landscape planning to writing regs and policies. She's currently serving as a division chief within the Ecological Services Program in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Headquarters Office. So Michelle, I will turn it over to you. I can see your presentation, that looks great. But I can't hear you or see you, so you may wanna turn right. it I just unmuted. Yeah, yeah I can hear you now. I can't get the video to go. Okay. Yeah, it says that the host has me blocked, so. Oh, okay. I'm also I'll like that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There we can go. see you now. <laughs> go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, all right. So today I thought I would just do a quick um, endangered species 101 um, and just realize this is going to be a high level and I'll try not to um, dive deep into stuff since I am a, a policy wonk. So it's easy for me to do that. I will attempt not to. So um, first off, a couple of things to think about with um, when thinking about the Endangered Species Act, well, um, uh, let's see if I can get there. Um, it was passed in 1973. Um, it has had several amendments in that, since then. One of those amendments I'll talk about later that was pretty significant in the 1980s. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, the Endangered Species Act goes through, and you'll hear folks that are practitioners talk about the Endangered Species Act in terms of sections. So here like section 10 or section seven. Um, the way the law was written is that the intent was spelled out in the first part of the law in section two. The intent of the law actually is to get at ecosystem management, but it's doing that through looking at individual species. Um, and and so that is one point that we try and focus in on in the Fish and Wildlife Services. Although we are using species as proxies for ecosystems, we are really thinking about conserving, um, and so there's that word, um, conserving um, ecosystems rather than just individual species. That being said, a lot of the process that the Endangered Species Act sets up is very species centric. So um, you do sort of have to do this back and forth in your mind, thinking about making sure that whatever species you're working on is put into the context of the habitat or the ecosystem that it resides in. Um, so, you know, one thing that we always think about in um, implementing the Endangered Species Act is that, you know, we root all of our decisions in the best available science, but you know, that's done within the legal constraints of the law itself. And a lot of social science comes into that. Um, there are specific places within the law and our regs where we cannot let social science or other things come into play, but there are a lot of places where it does. So uh, another thing to keep in mind. And so you'll start to see as I go through this um, presentation where we start talking about sections. And, and really what I would do is ignore the, that part and think about um, what the intent of that, um, that section really was. And so uh, when we think about the Endangered Species Act, the intent of section four is to talk about both how things get protected under the act, as well as then how we get them off the act. Um, and that in particular is the act of recovery um, as laid out in the law. So the law is very specific that, you know, there are certain things we have to look at when we provide protection. So just, um, just at an overview, the protection of the act means that you cannot, if the species is listed, you cannot take that species. And that means harm and harass, and we can get into a lot of debate about what that is, but we have those defined we have lots of legal cases around what harm and harass means. Essentially, no one can take a listed species. That, mean, that's, that applies to everyone in the United States. And so um, it's a fairly broad um, provision of protection that the, that the law provides. 
Now, uh, saying that, the law then sets up a whole entire process of analysis and recovery to help alleviate that constraint, if you want to look at it that way. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is recovery plans, what those look like. So in the course of implementing the Endangered Species Act, the way that it's set up is there's this sort of pre-analysis. We have candidate um, lists. We don't have very many species on that list right now, but we try and flag those species that are in need of protection of the act, um, but may or may not be able to get that protection right now. And it could be constraints from the Fish and Wildlife Service itself. So for instance, we recently did an analysis for the monarch butterfly. We decided that that species was in need of protection of the act. However, um, our workload and um, at this point uh, doesn't allow us to actually put it on the, uh, and pro provide it protection. So it um, is warranted to, for that protection, but it, is, um, but it is something that we can't do right now. And we do have a timeline set out to actually do that in the next few years. So just to give you an example of it is, we consider the monarch now a candidate species. So we have flagged a few species um, before it actually gets those protections. And we have a lot of lists that we use for at-risk species that are generated by, this, by the states and others that are out there. Probably you guys have some of those lists as well that we're sort of watching to decide whether we need um, protection. So there's various ways you can get that protection. There's a petition process. There's um, our own internal process that allows us to evaluate whether that particular species needs protection or not. So I'm not going to talk about the listing process, but just so you know, that's how it gets the protection of the act. Um, at that point, our whole job and the way that the Endangered Species Act is laid out is to get that species off of the list, to get it delisted. And from our perspective, that delisting is recovered. So in our minds, once the species no longer needs the protection of the act, it is, we can delist it and therefore it is recovered. We monitor it, there's post delisting monitoring, there's, you know, we can always put things back on the list if we need to, hopefully we don't. Um, and, you know, we've had several species come off the list, bald eagle, um, peregrine falcon, you know, we just talked about um, Kirtland warbler. So, you know, that's our process is whether or not, so recovery from our standpoint is, can we get it off the list? We're doing everything, we're removing threats, we're addressing, um, you know, those sort of things, at trying to get it off the list. And so one other thing that is important to think about in the Endangered Species Act uh, realm is the definition between threatened and endangered. We have two possible definitions. You know, we can list things under threatened or we can list things under endangered. The thing to remember there is that um, it is the same definition. If the species um, is in danger of extinction, then it should get the protection of the act. The only difference between endangered and threatened is a time difference. Um, you, can get listed as threatened if those threats are in the foreseeable future. We have a lot of lawsuits around what foreseeable future looks like. Um, essentially, it's something in the future we can see and portray. There's some threat that we know is coming and that allows us to, um, to give it protection. Um, even though currently it may not be in danger of extinction. So again, the, dif the difference between endangered and threatened is really just foreseeable future. It is the same definition. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not those threats are acting on that species right now or sometime in the foreseeable future. Great example of this is polar bear. When we listed polar bear, um, the threats weren't acting on it right then. We still had a very vibrant population of polar bears. However, you know, all of the models pointed to the fact that we were gonna lose ice 
um, due to climate change. And that we could see into the future. And therefore we listed polar bear as threatened because those threats are coming. And so one of the analysis that we have to do as we think about recovery of species is this idea of looking into the future. And, and what you'll see is that we've got um, a lot of things that help us modeling, that sort of thing, um, look into the future and decide how those threats are gonna be acting on the species. So um, let's go to the next one. I know this looks really busy, um, but a couple of things I just wanted to point out. This is how the Fish and Wildlife Service thinks about recovery. Um, Ultimately, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but up here in the left-hand side, the species gets listed. It, it requires the protection of the Endangered Species Act. At that point, we have 30 days to create a recovery outline. That's an internal document that helps the Fish and Wildlife Service figure out where to go with recovery of the species. How do we get that species off the list? Again, you know, that delisting is ultimately where we're trying to go. That's what we mean by recovery. So we have a, this interim document. It's an outline that's created within 30 days that tells us sort of a path forward. Um, and then we start working on the recovery plan and that's the next piece of the document. Um, and so this is sort of our planning step, phase two. And we have a three-part framework that we use in order to provide a, a really a, an in-depth plan forward on how we would uh, remove the threats and get that species off the list. It starts by doing a species status assessment. This is something we've been doing within the last five to seven years. It is, we have to do a status assessment, but we've provided ourselves with a framework of how to do that. That framework is really centered around looking at the historic threats, the current threats, and those future threats. That future threat piece is very important to us to, to figure out the difference between threatened and endangered. The reason we wanna do that is we have different management uh, options if the species is listed as threatened. And so that's why that difference between endangered and threatened becomes important. So we have a species status assessment. That particular document holds the science for the species. Um, and so that's what we think of when we think of an SSA. You might hear the words SSA, Species Status Assessment. That feeds into our plan. And there's um, the act lays out specific things that the plan has to contain. It has to contain criteria actions, and it also has to contain a time and cost action estimate to get those actions done. And so what we've then also created is this recovery implementation strategy. And that's the piece that's really important for our partners and stakeholders to, to invo be involved in and be part of. The reason that's important is because it lays out the activities, the actual things that need to happen in order to remove the threats and get that species off the list. That is a working document. We're still um, working on getting all of that stuff online in a, in a much better fashion. That's one of the, our current priorities is trying to get our, our recovery implementation strategies um, in a way that partners can go in and engage on figuring out how to help get those actions completed. So that's our planning phase. Once that plan is completed, then we go into this implementation and monitoring phase. And, and the other feedback mechanism that the law puts in is this five-year review status. So we have to, every five years, go back and look at our status assessment. Do we need to update it? Do we need to uh, figure out if something's changed? So every five years, we're constantly sort of figuring out what actions still need to be done. Do we need to change anything? Is there new, any new information? That's done every five years. That feeds back into the recovery planning and the implementation of monitoring. So those are the important parts. The stuff below is sort of our, our um, decision-making process for ultimately making sure that if we are moving to the point where the species is recovered and we can delist it, it no longer requires the, the act for protection, there's a process then for us to, to remove it and get it off the list. And you've seen that with several species, bald eagle, one of the, the most important ones, I guess. Probably not the most important, but one of the ones that everyone knows, how's that? Um, all right, 
So the important thing to think about, to remember on this slide is really just that first phase, the outline within 30 days. The second thing is our planning process. That's our recovery plan that includes those three parts. And then phase three is our implementation and monitoring. That implementation and monitoring piece, that's the piece that's really important to actually moving the species towards a place where it no longer needs the protection of the act. That's where our partners engage. That's where the on the ground actions happen. That's where we really need our, our, our partners help. Okay. So just to reemphasize sort of all of, all of that that I just said, the species status assessment, um, that's what holds all of the science for the, spe for the species. What you'll see is that all of the species that have been listed within the five, past five years have a species status assessment. We're still backlogged and trying to get some of the species that are already currently on the list a species status assessment. We're prioritizing those species that we think might um, be in need of a um, decision. So either a down list or a delist. And so you'll see those species that we think uh, are ready for making that decision to get a species status assessment. We are trying to sort of catch up, but we already have 1300 species on the list. So trying to create SSAs for all those species is, is a challenge for us. Um, we, as part of that species status assessment, it is peer reviewed. That is a, a piece that we've been really trying to do because it's outside our um, decision-making and uh, procedures that go with regulations we can um, do a peer review um, piece, which has been a really benefit to um, making sure that we've got the best available science. We also have SSA teams that have been put together, especially for those species that are, you know, controversial or um, large, you know, wide ranging species. We have um, anywhere from a few people to a large group. Um, and that's another place of engagement. We definitely have our state partners on those SSA teams. Um, so just another place where our partners and stakeholders can engage with us. Um, the next thing we have is recovery teams and, and everyone likes to focus on you know, these recovery teams. And I can tell you, if you look um, at the bullets here, our current approach for those recovery teams is to make them small, maybe even um, only service or a, a, a particular um, biologists, because what we've been trying to focus on is those recovery implement implementation strategies, those RISs, rather than the plan itself, the plan has to include very specific information to meet um, the conditions of the law. And so what we've been trying to do with our recovery teams lately is um, not make them part of doing recovery plans, but actually, um, make them part of the implementation strategy instead. And so you'll see that there's workshops and working groups and recovery implementation teams instead. And that's really where we would like our stakeholders and our partners to focus in the, in the future is not actually on recovery teams, but on these um, working groups to get those actions done instead. And so I already mentioned the recovery implementation strategy and then, um, once we've delisted the species, we have a post delisting monitoring plan. Um, and that's another place where we really need our partners to engage. I think that's it for, oh, one more thing. What you'll hear, sorry, Sarah, Mar, are you trying to cut me off? <laughs> We're just a few minutes over. I know it's a lot to squish this small amount of time. So yeah. I will um, go very quickly through this. It'll be get reemphasized with the panel members. So, but I just want to give a quick overview if that's okay. Okay, um, all right, so some of the tools that the um, ESA has that you'll hear about with the rest of the recovery with the team members. Um, you'll hear something about permits. Um, so we have multiple different tools under section 10, so don't worry about the section, but um, you've probably heard about candidate conservation agreements. Those focus on species that are not listed. We have um, safe harbor agreements that we use as a different type of plan to actually um, help species that, um, and landowners in particular. So section 10 is for private landowners. It helps us work with private landowners to get conservation on the ground. 
rather than and give them assurances that they are, don't have to violate section nine, which is that take prohibition. So safe harbor agreements, habitat conservation plans, you'll hear about that with Kirtland Warbler. And then we also do experimental populations, which is, is a regulation that helps us actually introduce species on the ground. Um, consultations are done with federal agencies. You'll probably hear about that with um, Red Cockaded Woodpecker as well. Our DOD partners have really used that particular um, provision to help with the conservation of that species. And then we've got uh, multiple grants that go out to our partners um, through section six and within our own budget to help with on the ground activities as well. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. I hate to rush you. I know we're like, oh, give us an overview of endangered species in 10 minutes. So I know that that's a heavy lift and we appreciate your your viewpoints and your perspective there. So thank you. Um, I don't, we don't have time for questions, but there are some questions in the Q&A, Michelle, if you would be willing to type in some answers there if you have them. Um, I think we'll move on to uh, our Kirtland's warbler story. Um, uh, Dr. Carol Bassetti is full professor in fisheries and wildlife biology at California University of Pennsylvania. She's been involved with Kirtland's warbler recovery since 1986 and served on the recovery team as a voting member and team leader. As leader, she led the effort to develop the Kirtland's warbler conservation team to take over the interagency coordination to implement the management required to sustain the species once it was removed from the endangered species list. So as a founding member of this collaborative, self-governing public-private partnership, she's helped break new ground to sustain a delisted conservation reliant species. So very excited to hear this. Thanks, Dr. Bassetti, and I'll turn it over to you. I can see your slides. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be invited and to, to share the collaborative conservation story of, of Kirtland's warbler recovery. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Um, very briefly, uh, the species winters in primarily the central uh, islands of the Bahama Island archipelago, where they use low coppice and fruiting shrubs. They breed in the, primarily, <laughs> in the north, uh, northern lower peninsula of Michigan. And it is there where they are uh, pretty extreme habitat specialists. Um, where they're associated with the sandy outwash plains with large sands of young jack pine um, that are patchily distributed in these dense thickets. Uh, also, uh, they use the low woody ground shrubs that uh, provide an important nest cover for the species. So historically, this habitat uh, was created by large fires that regularly occurred in the natural landscape. And uh, in terms of our understanding of, of limiting factors, um, we actually understood those factors pretty early on, uh, even prior to, to listing, uh, because of research that was being done by amateur ornithologists um, as far back as the, the 1930s. So, so the threats included uh, habitat loss due to uh, occupation by people in the uh, jack pine plains and um, that resulted in fire suppression, and even when fires did occur, uh, they did not cover the vast landscapes that they once did. Uh, another contributing factor to habitat loss was the conversion of, of uh, the natural jack pine plains to red pine plantations that are more profitable. And then the second threat uh, had to do with uh, brown-headed cowbird parasitism, uh, and that impact was um, really pretty severe. So uh, based on these threats, uh, the Kirtland's warbler was actually listed uh, under the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966. It was one of the original 78 birds and mammals called the class of 67. Um, and the decline that those uh, researchers, early researchers predicted was um, confirmed in the third decennial census in 1971. And not only did we see the collapse in numbers uh, but we also saw a, a pretty major contraction uh, of the, the range of the species. So where they once uh, occupied just about anywhere that the, the Sandy Outwash Plains and Jack Pine Co. occurred, uh, now they were limited to only 14 townships in north central Michigan. Uh, 
Uh, so the, the agencies were able to immediately respond uh, because they'd actually already been working with each other uh, and also working with those amateur ornithologists that were doing research. Uh, and so in a way, thinking about yesterday's talks, we, we kind of avoided that uh, loading dock paradigm um, because research and management kind of evolved together because we had the right people in positions of, of management in the, in the agencies uh, on the ground who were responsive to those researchers uh, to address the, the rapidly declining species. Uh, so uh, additional uh, in federal act was passed and the state uh, act was passed and the recovery team was actually the first team ever appointed under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and they were able to produce a, a recovery plan very quickly again because they were already uh, collaborating with each other uh, and they were already linked uh, to the applied science. And in fact, membership on the team uh, reflected that understanding of the necessary expertise that was needed to address the threats uh, of the species. So implementation uh, began in earnest uh, around 1980. Uh, and so what I mean by that, um, we did have in the recovery plan, the luxury of public lands. Uh, so you can see in orange here, uh, the areas that were set aside uh, in the Huron National Forest and in red, the management areas that were set aside uh, in various state forests. But I don't want you to think that this was all smooth and, and, and peaceful. Uh, this is where the agencies actually faced their first challenge uh, and dealt with the tension on the landscape of competing needs. Um, both agencies uh, had to um, kind of resolve the pressure for timber production, especially red pine, uh, with the, the habitat requirements of the, of the Kirtland's warbler. But they worked together and they kind of held each other accountable actually um, for each of them to do their fair share. So what that management looked like was they, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service continued to uh, remove the brown-headed cowbird and um, the agencies, uh, the Forest Service and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources put in these plantations using this kind of inverse sine wave um, pattern. Uh, and this was based on the, the coarse grain knowledge that we had about optimal habitat from, from the species, from the, from the researchers. Um, they also closed habitats to uh, use by the public during the peak breeding period. And this actually led to the, to the second big challenge uh, in the recovery program. Um, because those habitat closures uh, created these new tensions on the landscape with, with another landowner in the region who perceived harm uh, from that policy. And that landowner was Camp Grayling, uh, which is uh, a National Guard training base uh, right there in the core of the range of, of the species. Uh, so the, the Guard actually resented those habitat closures uh, and the conflicts grew pretty quickly uh, to the point where the Indiana Guard said they weren't going to train it at Camp, Gr Camp Grayling. Uh, and you have to remember the, the, the DNR and the Fish and Wildlife Service have this legal mandate at this point um, to recover the species and protect them. And about 30% of the warbler population occurred on the tank range at, um, at Camp Grayling. Uh, and then in 1975, things got worse because the Bald, Fil Bald Hill fire occurred uh, due to artillery fire. Uh, and uh, when the regeneration after that fire became occupiable, um, that's when we kind of hit the tipping point because the military was about to be charged with violations under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, so in 1983, um, in response, Camp Grayling hired a biologist and he was actually appointed to the recovery team uh, as an ex officio member. Uh, and, and here's a case where the right person made a huge difference uh, in, in the um, perceptions of the, of the issue. Um, he actually negotiated a land exchange where Camp Grayling um, deeded the Bald Hill fire area to the DNR in exchange uh, for the right to conduct maneuvers in unsuitable habitat. Uh, and they signed this cooperative agreement. And at that point they got better press than what was being put in the papers during this really peak conflict period. Uh, and, and that cooperative agreement and that agreement that 
they could conduct maneuvers in unsuitable habitat actually created another little problem because uh, Camp Grayling found themselves having to, uh, over time as disturbance happened, having to hydroax uh, young jack pine down so that it didn't become suitable. And this is where innovation actually began because um, the relationship was good at this point and, and it was suggested that we could employ a safe harbor-like approach uh, and allow the habitat to become suitable uh, but allow the, the guard to conduct their, their training missions. In other words, allow some incidental take, uh, but still get uh, high amounts of productivity for the warbler out of that landscape. And so um, that interagency agreement was signed um, and then um, updated in, in 97. So um, that's kind of a great example of, of uh, working together and collaborating to resolve a serious issue. Uh, so continuing to think about these recovery efforts, we also had to continue monitoring um, to, to feed back in to assess those management actions. Uh, and the singing male census was done on all occupied habitat annually after that decline was detected. Uh, so from 1972 on, um, and all of the partners would help each other every year to conduct that, including by the way, Camp Grayling personnel uh, after that issue uh, had been resolved. Um, okay, so after the revision of the recovery plan, uh, normally recovery teams disband, uh, but this team stayed together uh, and, and basically evolved into an interagency um, implementation team. Uh, and so they kept that uh, recovery plan current and adaptive, and they also oversaw uh, the research and kept it strongly linked to the management. Uh, so the, the research uh, in Michigan, um, especially the, the monitoring program, that singing male census, but also color banding programs and ecosystem studies uh, allowed the, the fine grain research uh, to improve our understanding of those limiting factors uh, and how to ameliorate them and allowed us to, to update that plan on a regular basis, the, the habitat management plan. Um, in the Bahamas, um, we did not actually understand the potential limiting factors, uh, particularly of the future uh, on those wintering grounds and in migration. And so we had to learn about the species habitat relationships and also build them into uh, management uh, plans, considering the social and economic impacts or limitations of implementing those plans. And this is ongoing work that's being done by the Nature Conservancy uh, at the time it was TNC, now ABC is more involved, uh, and the Forest Service and the Bahamas National Trust. Um, so that's uh, kind of four of the recovery strategies. And then the last one that's really important to talk about is the information and education piece. Um, so a little backstory here, in Michigan, uh, in the late 1980s, the, the timber harvest of the recovery program uh, were upsetting the public. And in response, the Michigan State Legislature actually um, proposed to limit clear cut size. And that would have completely shut down uh, our, our recovery program. Um, so um, as a result, the recovery team hired a, a consultant uh, to develop an information and education communication plan, realizing that it wasn't enough to do the tours that, that we had been doing for years, because that was really preaching to the choir, right? It's birders who are interested in coming to see the species. So we realized that we needed to do much more. And with the consultant, we developed um, a guided driving tour through the habitat. Um, we put together a uh, Curlin's Warbler Festival. We put up signs like this fight for survival or what is happening here uh, signage at the clear cuts uh, to kind of explain uh, what we were doing. Uh, we increased the number of school programs and we did a calendar contest sort of working with kids to, to, to reach into the community through those programs. Um, and uh, also I think it's uh, important to point out here um, that we learned a hard lesson that um, we can't forget about those original tensions, the first challenges that, that, I, that I spoke about. Uh, and we realized that in, internally even, we had to continually educate 
new people that came in. Um, there was a lot of turnover in, in these agencies doing the management and we needed to educate uh, people in, in the agencies actually about the value of the program, including the ecosystem services uh, and the multi-species benefits. And, and the multi-species benefits were significant. Um, but, but as a recovery program, um, we genuinely had to learn uh, how to modify our original protocols to accommodate some of these species in a more deliberate way, to move beyond that single species view. Um, in other words, we couldn't just talk about post priori benefits for other species, but, but given some planning, uh, we could actually benefit some of these species um, that, are, that are compatible with, with Kirtland's warbler ahead of time. Okay, uh, so <laughs> those are the five strategies uh, that we used for recovery. And, and the big question, of course, is did it work? So um, the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, once cowbird and habitat limitations were addressed, you can see um, in 1987-88 in when that work became suitable uh, that, that the warblers responded uh, and as that habitat was created, the numbers kept going up um, very predictably. And not only did the numbers go up, but the species kind of refilled uh, into the, the um, natural range of the species. Uh, and so that was, that was excellent. Uh, so in 2006, as a recovery team, uh, we knew we had reached uh, and sustained the recovery of the species for five years, which is what was written in the plan uh, to consider uh, delisting. Um, however, we also understood that we still have to apply the full life cycle recovery strategies, all five, and we have to do them every single year. So what I'm saying is that the, the species is, is completely uh, conservation reliant. Um, we also knew that if we delisted the bird, that many of those threats would return. Um, so we recognized that without the Endangered Species Act, the biggest threat would be failure to implement those recovery strategies on both the breeding and the non-breeding sites. Um, because we, the expectation was we would lose money and we would re, um, lose priority uh, in the agencies that were doing that management. So, so the conservation uh, reliance, the reality of that was now squarely in front of us. Uh, and we knew that we could not follow the normal precedent uh, for delisting. So we also knew that we had a great model for collaborative conservation. We just needed to formalize it and make it self-governing. So based on what worked, we wanted to take this interagency implementation team that was the Kirtland's Warbler um, that had collaborated to keep this recovery plan um, active and, and updated and, and current, um, but we recognized that we were currently doing this under the, the mandate of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, so we knew that we needed to develop this new infrastructure. So in 2011, the agencies of the team, the partners and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, signed an MOU um, to develop this new infrastructure. So uh, the, the idea was to build the comfort, uh, conservation infrastructure that would survive after we crossed this benchmark of delisting. We had to replace that interagency implementation team with a strong partnership that would have the capacity to sustain conservation strategies throughout the life cycle of the species, holding each other accountable uh, rather than relying on a Fish and Wildlife Service appointed um, team. So we did launch that group in, in 2016. And we were thoughtful about who should be on this interagency collaborative team. Uh, so we took what worked with the recovery team in terms of expertise that was necessary and kind of built on that with the additions providing the, the new capacity that we needed or thought we would need to address the need to expand the range in response to climate change and to include those human dimensions um, to address both social and economic viability of the program. Uh, so the, the structure and process uh, 
of building this uh, conservation team was really important because we knew we were going to have to self-govern. And based on actually consultations with, with non-listed species working groups like the Golden Wing Warbler um, Initiative and the Young Forest Initiative, um, we took a lot of their advice uh, on structure and process and developed our own charter. Uh, you can see here that the human dimensions uh, is more upfront now. Uh, we knew we were gonna have to continue some of those uh, social programs but we also knew we were gonna have to expand our conservation capacity um, to, to address these, these new issues. Uh, we also addressed the full life cycle. So you can see the, the non-breeding as well as the breeding season. And another thing I'll point out is that um, we built on the legacy uh, of this successful interaction between research and management. And rather than having a separate box for research and a separate box for monitoring. We just embedded those processes uh, into the, the, the active subcommittees. Um, we also wrote the conservation plan to incorporate uh, all new actionable science up to, up to that point um, in the habitat management strategy. That was mostly ecological science that was getting incorporated. Um, but we also included recommendations to pursue new science um, on 25% of the habitat created to address that economic viability and social viability of the program. Um, and we also knew that we needed to address that full life cycle. So we began developing um, the, the management plans outside of the, um, outside of Michigan. Okay, um, so the memorandum of agreement for the first uh, breeding range conservation plan was signed in 2014 uh, with the understanding that we would expand that memorandum of agreement to include Wisconsin, Ontario, and the Bahamas and try to join all of those plans together. And we also felt that we needed this nonprofit organization, the Kirtland's Warbler Alliance, that would um, have the responsibility of increasing community engagement and building um, additional strong partnerships uh, for the investment in the species and also to um, have a voice uh, and ability to, to advocate in the legislature. And we also knew we were going to need money to fill in the gaps uh, of implementation that we expected to occur once the species was delisted. So uh, we did begin the, the fundraising and to date we have multiple funds that are um, steadily growing. So uh, we had this infrastructure in place uh, and that allowed Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in 2019 to delist the species after 52 years of protection uh, as an endangered species. So we showed that we could function. And um, I think, how do we know that that partnership is working? Um, because the program is responding to new research. So regarding cowbird control, uh, we actually suspended cowbird control in 2018. And the work of Nathan Cooper um, has shown um, that that decrease in cowbird that was being observed through the breeding bird survey um, um, his work has shown that even without cowbird control at all, we're still seeing very little parasitism. Only six out of 456 nests um, were parasitized since that suspension in 2018. Uh, we know it's working because uh, research is showing that Kirtland's warblers can use red pine plantations when there's this incidental growth of, of jack pine. And so um, we're experimenting with more economically viable uh, planting composition and stocking densities. Um, we know it's working because uh, when we did just recently experience some habitat shortfalls by one of the agencies uh, due to a couple years of, of uh, not planting enough and then COVID and then in 2021, a 2000 acre fire in occupiable habitat, um, there was an immediate response by leadership and the partner agencies um, and, and they've um, reached out to each other and have a plan to work together to rectify that situation. Um, in, in terms of monitoring, we just accomplished the um, largest census effort ever. Um, and we did that uh, concurrent with uh, a new monitoring technique that's being developed by Nathan Cooper 
um, to, to give us better monitoring information with, uh, with the probability of detection attached to it for the future uh, monitoring protocols. Um, and, and because the Human Dimensions Subcommittee continues to do systems mapping and, and gap analysis to make sure that we have the capacity to implement the, the program. Um, and um, also because those funds are steadily growing. So I think we're checking the boxes and showing success uh, in, in uh, functioning without the, the Endangered Species Act. So uh, thanks, and I uh, hope I didn't go too, I, th I hope I stayed in. <laughs> you did, you did great. Thank you so much, Carol. We appreciate your insights and what a cool story. It's, it's, it's very exciting to see those success stories and not without challenges for sure. So right. <laughs> thank you. And we look forward to your insights during the panel as well. I'm gonna keep on trucking. Uh, Carol, there are some questions in the Q and A. If you can type answers to those, that would be great. They're really good questions. And I'm interested in those answers as well, so. So thank you. Next, we'll move to Jeff Walters. Jeff Walters is the Bailey Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. He has studied red cockaded woodpecker for four decades from the early 1980s when the species was in rapid decline and there were no increasing populations of the species to today when it is on the verge of recovery. He leads ongoing long-term studies of three populations of 27 to 42 years in duration. Good job, Jeff. Served on the most recent species recovery team and along with a postdoc in his lab and four U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service scientists produced the most recent species status assessment for RCW. Jeff also chaired panels that reviewed the recovery programs for endangered California condor and Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. I will turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you. I can see your slides. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, and thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right in as I have a good bit to cover. And also in the interest of time, I'm going to call the red cockaded woodpecker the RCW from now on. So I'm calling this talk a personal history because everything I know about how to succeed in species conservation, I learned from experience. When I got involved with RCW recovery, I had no plan. I knew nothing about the things that we're talking about at this conference. In fact, I knew nothing about wildlife management, endangered species policy, conservation biology, or human dimensions. Some of those things didn't exist yet. Others existed, but in a different universe, the universe of wildlife biology and management. My university universe was the ivory tower of basic biology. My training was in what was then the brand new exciting field of behavioral ecology the field of conservation biology that triggered the bridging of the gap between these two universes uh, didn't exist yet. Non-game programs and wildlife agencies were, were not a thing. Yet, despite all of this, if you remember uh, Ashley's diagram in her opening talk yesterday with the two parts of the implementation gap and the two boxes where scientists are involved uh, in recovery and conservation, that could, I could have used that as an outline for my story because that's pretty much an outline of how the RCW was recovered. But the things with, that were done were done because they worked. They were the only pathway forward. We didn't have anything like that diagram that actually showed as a plan, but I would argue you could create it as a description of the history of RCW recovery. So a few things first that you need to know about uh, RCW, first, it's a cooperative breeder. They have non-breeding adult helpers, which are mostly young that have stayed at home in their natal territory into adulthood. And this is why I began to study the RCW. I was interested in their social system. I wasn't interested in their recovery at that point. Cooperative breeding, uh, the evolution of cooperative breeding was the one relevant thing that I knew about coming out of my uh, ivory tower. Uh, the second thing is that they excavate cavities in living pine trees. This means they need old trees for cavity trees, uh, and it takes them years rather than days to weeks as it takes most woodpeckers to construct uh, a cavity, but they can also use them for many, many years, even decades once they're complete. And finally, they're endemic to the longleaf, uh, the, the pine ecosystems of the Southeastern US, and they especially favor the um, core habitat type of longleaf pine. So they declined mostly due to habitat loss. The original vast longleaf forests were cleared and converted to other things. 
only 3% of that area remains in longleaf today. And the areas that it, there's still longleaf were degraded by loss of the old trees that the RCWs need for their cavities and also by fire suppression, which turns the savanna-like conditions of, of longleaf you see on the right into what you see on the left uh, if you've suppressed fire long enough. When I began to work on RCWs in the early 1980s, they were headed for extinction. They were declining pretty rapidly. There wasn't a single increasing population. That diagram at the top there, top right is from an old paper from the, the mid 1980s. It shows that um, the white is the stable populations. The red is the maybe stable, but almost certainly declining. And the green is definitely declining. And the blue is, is the gone extinct. So they were almost all declining. Uh, today, they're proposed for downlisting to uh, threatened, and the species status assessment that I was part of showed just the opposite, that 72% of the populations of over 30 groups were increasing, and in fact, only, only one of the 32 largest populations was decreasing. So, what happened in that period? Well, I like to look at causes of population decline as uh, occurring for one of two reasons, either something about vital rates are in the population growth uh, equation, which is usually, which is problems with productivity or survival or a carrying capacity, a K problem. It has to do with things being off in terms of habitat rather than being off in terms of vital rates. And the first thing that struck me uh, about RCWs was that their vital rates reproduction survival weren't lower in declining populations. They weren't even lower in populations that, that went extinct. So the RCW had a habitat problem, a K problem, which is obvious on a large scale since most of their habitat is gone, but wasn't obvious what it was on a smaller scale, on the small scale where they still existed. So the theory about the evolution of cooperative breeding at the time was expressed in hypotheses called habitat saturation and benefits of philopatry. The basic idea was that places to breed were so scarce that young were better off waiting at home until a spot opens up rather than dispersing to look for a spot. And this doesn't necessarily mean that there was no open habitat. It could be that there was no high quality habitat and they do so much worse in available poor quality habitat that they're better waiting off. Uh, they're better off waiting for the high quality stuff. And my application of this idea to RCWs was that because cavities took so long to excavate and were used so long, and then each family group had multiple cavities, a set of cavities, that the set of cavities was a valuable resource and individuals were better off um, waiting for those kind of places. In other words, poor habitat with cav cavities was better than otherwise good habitat that didn't have any cavities. So they reject the no cavity places and wait for an opening where cavities already exist and this is why they're cooperative breeders. There were clear management implications of this idea, but it wasn't well received in the RCW world to say the least. The folks that were funding RCW recovery at the time called it the dumbest idea they'd ever heard. And you can't really blame them because here was this newbie from some other universe babbling about habitat saturation and didn't seem to know that woodpeckers make their own cavities. So here we have an implementation gap, a pretty sizable one at this point. So we had to test the, uh, the management implications uh, actually as a ba another basic biology um, project. We got NSF money to um, basically use, make cavities to test this theory about the evolution of cooperative breeding. A graduate student of mine, Carol Copion, invented a way to drill cavities into living pine trees. And what we did was we took 140 areas of 150 acres each of unoccupied habitat and we put some cavities in 20 of them, and the other 20 were matched control areas, and we got 19 out of 20 occupied uh, versus no controls. And at the time, this was might not seem like much, 19 new family groups, but this was the biggest increase in an RCW population that had been observed at that date. So at this point, we started with research, and especially it was basic research, and basic research suggested a new management paradigm that focused on cavities as a critical component of habitat quality. Also, there were other things involved, especially prescribed fire uh, as a, a way to improve habitat otherwise. So I, this exemplifies the importance of basic research in 
species conservation. It's where paradigm shifts often come from, major breakthroughs come from. There's no su a substitute for understanding uh, basic biology. But we're certainly got a long way to go to get across the implementation gap at this point. So the next step was some applied research, which was uh, essentially translational ecology to prove that this could actually work, this new management paradigm which was carried out at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, Marine Corps Base, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, two military bases. So here you see um, Camp Lejeune, some pictures from there. Um, it was slowly declining uh, at the time we started. We implemented the new management starting in 1991. Uh, it took off, it had been at 26 groups and it went up to 121 groups today. And next we did this at a larger population in the, in, on Eglin Air Force Base. And again, uh, that started at a population size of 217 groups in 1994. It was declining fairly rapidly up to that point. And, we, and since 1994, it's gone up to 547 groups. It's been declared recovered as of 2009. So the rest of the story. So first there was the science and then now we're getting across the implementation gap. Um, and getting across that gap started with these two studies. And basically the last 30 years of RCW recovery have been all about co-production. There was a new recovery team organized that put out a recovery plan in 2003 that basically validated the new science, enabled fish and wildlife to use the new management paradigm as what they required of managers. And that was the end of the recovery team. Uh, there's been no recovery team since over so the last 20 years when most of the actual growth of populations happen. Uh, what was going on was scientists working with managers, with decision makers, with stakeholders. Uh, at the local and regional level, all of this was overseen by the species coordinator with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's, it's pretty much describes what I did in various places, starting with these two studies. I chose these two sites for the proof of concept studies because of the people involved. There was a lot of ideologically based conflict at the time. And the key was to put aside that conflict and instead try to integrate goals, different land uses, goals of the managers and, and different stakeholders involved. At these sites, these military bases, the, the, the goals were RCW recovery, military training and timber harvest. And the people involved were the, my group for RCW recovery, the military command and the natural resource managers on base, which on the bases, which uh, who played a really, really important role they govern forestry, uh, wildlife, and dangerous species management. At these two sites, these groups were dedicated to integrating goals, whereas my other study site, the North Carolina Sand Hills, uh, everybody was in conflict and, and proof of concept study would have been impossible there. So as Carol also alluded to, who individuals in key positions are and what their views are matters a lot. There's, that cannot be overestimated. You need to find the right people and work with them, focus efforts where those right people, the right people are in place. Because we knew a lot about RCW biology, we knew that disturbance from military training wasn't really a problem at all, as long as the habitat wasn't altered, cavity trees weren't destroyed. So it was pretty easy to strike a deal with the Department of Defense and the, the regional level deal, as well as the deal on these particular bases was that if the RCW populations could be recovered, could be increased, and all restrictions on military training to avoid disturbing the birds would go away. More compromise was needed with uh, timber harvest. You had to protect the old growth. You had to thin instead of clear cutting, which had been the traditional method of forestry in, in pine habitats. But this was okay with, with DOD. So they were all in on this deal very quickly. And I think it's why D the Department of Defense has led uh, RCW recovery uh, throughout. It's a tougher deal for a forest service, so forest service is doing a great job now as well. Okay, now let me turn to uh, uh, an example at the regional level of interacting with decision makers and, and lessons I learned about that. Uh, basically about the, being in the room when decisions are made, a key role for scientists and a role that scientists don't often play, either they're excluded or they're not interested in, in that kind of interaction. And my lessons there came when I was summoned to a meeting in Atlanta with the policy people in Fish and Wildlife and the Forest Service who were debating some major changes 
in policy based on new science. And they wanted to know what would happen if they did X, what would happen if they did Y, what was likely to happen if they did Z. And I learned that first, that decision makers need unbiased interpretations of relevant science, but they don't view all scientists as reliable sources for that. A few of the scientists working with RCWs at the time were there, invited to the meeting, but many, some were, there were others that were conspicuously absent. And I asked why two in particular were not there. And I was told, we know what they will say, so there's no reason to invite them. So the lesson there is if you want to be in the room when decisions are made, you have to be perceived as objective and honest. You can't be perceived as representing some particular stakeholder group or as self-serving trying to direct funding towards your own area of interest. This role that's trying to be the objective, what we call the arbiter of science is not for everyone. It sometimes means saying things you might personally wish you didn't have to say because you're trying to be honest and objective about what should be done. Um, some are scientists are more comfortable in other roles and there are certainly other roles in the science policy interaction, like helping to influence policy through lobbying. But you need some people in this science arbitration role and one individual can't do both. It's very, very hard to walk that line and be both a lobbyist sometimes and arbiter of science at others. So it, it's something to um, that individuals have to choose which they want to do. All right, now let's move to the more to the co-production of implementing new the new management paradigm at the local level. That's where a lot of the action was over the last 20 years. In all three areas where I work, conservation partnerships were formed that integrated RCW recovery with other local objectives and involved not just Department of Defense. Um, and not just the local scientists like myself, but all kinds of stakeholders and interests as you, as you see listed here. I'm gonna talk about the Sand Hills, which has always been the most controversial site because uh, I think I learned more from that partnership than from the others. I was involved through uh, SEI, Sand Hills Ecological Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit that, that does a lot of the RCW work there. It's a science, basically a science organization. Um, and every member of all the different stakeholders, they could have one person on the, the steering committee for the partnership. And so uh, through SAI, I could do that. This partnership started very poorly, accomplished almost nothing at first. Then a close colleague steered me to a, a master's thesis written by one of his students about partnerships, about what makes them work and what makes them not work, which turned out to be an invaluable piece of human dimensions research. I sent a letter to members of the steering committee, listed the good features of the Sandhills partnership and the bad ones, hidden agendas being the, the chief among the bad ones. And at the very next meeting of the committee, everybody laid their, their cards on the table. Everyone's views were uh, viewed as valid, everybody's objectives. And after that, it's been highly effective, accomplished amazing things ranging from getting key lands in, into protection to creating a well-informed public that's enthusiastic about conservation. These partnerships are out there and the road to recovery could use them. For example, the Sand Hills Partnership, you could probably get them to do whatever you wanted them to do for Bachman Sparrows. Okay, and finally, and this will be my last slide, Sarah. Um, I wanna talk about conservation on private land, focusing again on the Sand Hills, uh, where conflict was especially heated. People were cutting their timber because they were afraid of RCWs, losing money doing it. Um, there was something called the wise use movement. Um, that was creating hysteria. It was 1980s level spotted owl kind of stuff going on in the Sand Hills. Then Robert Bonney from the Environmental Defense Fund came up with this concept of safe harbor you've heard about, brought it to RCWs in the Sand Hills for its very first application. Private landowners sign up for safe harbor. They're legally responsible for any RCWs on their land at that moment, but not for any new ones. So if you don't have any RCWs and you sign up, they can move onto your land. You can do still do whatever you want. Um, in other words, you can't, those RCWs are not uh, eligible for take. And it turned out that it wasn't really ideology driving the anger of private landowners. It was their concern about property values and being able to pass on their land or their children, things like that. And attitudes changed pretty much overnight. Wise use died a quick death. Uh, and thanks to Safe Harbor and the work of the Sand Hills Partnership, our RCWs have become celebrated rather than feared in the Sand Hills. Um, We've got new groups on private land um, since then, and, and none of them have ever been taken. So the people are happy to have them there. It was just the fear that they couldn't do anything. 
In fact, there's a new baseball team in the area the, in Fayetteville. They allowed the public to name the team and Woodpeckers won in a landslide. So they got a baseball team named after the RCW down there. Um, and on, I would encourage people involved in the road to recovery to think about the safe harbor concept. It doesn't have to be safe harbor, but something like that on, on private land. I found it to be really, really valuable. And with that, I will close. Thank you. What a cool story. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate your perspectives. I want a baseball team called the Woodpeckers too. That's awesome. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I think there may be some questions for you um, in the Q&A, maybe not, but we can have, <laughs> have other people ask questions as well and we'll get to those in the panel. I hope everybody's thinking of good panel questions. Okay, so next we're gonna move on to our sage grouse story. So Tim Griffiths will be presenting for us today. He is the Western lead for Working Lands for Wildlife, a partnership led by USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, whose purpose is to focus voluntary incentives to proactively conserve America's working private lands and maximize conservation values for wildlife. By partnering with thousands of producers and partners, more than 9 million acres of voluntary conservation actions have been implemented since 2012. As a result, ag productivity has increased, wildlife population improved, and risk associated with increased regulation for producers have diminished. Prior to his appointment with WLFW, Tim was instrumental in creation of the Sage Grouse Initiative and serves as the national coordinator since its inception in 2010. He's based in Bozeman, Montana. I will turn it over to you, Tim. Thank you. I can see your slides. Great, and thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm very pleased and honored to be able to share a little bit of NRCS's experience in conserving sage grouse and sage grouse habitat. Before I jump into this, I really want folks to take a little bit of time and, and feast your eyes upon these two beautiful photographs. The first is this iconic sage grouse, right? The, the largest North American grouse who for all sorts of reasons is just incredible, beautiful. And if for those of you that have traveled out West and uh, witnessed firsthand their mating ritual, you, you can attest that your life was forever changed and moved by that. Equally as impressive are these immense, large, intact sagebrush rangelands that uh, they make a living in and these are everything but um, uh, the big empty as they've been called these are incredibly diverse um, full of life in fact that's why there's 350 species that also share this range with sage grouse and so our sage grouse initiative is really aimed at conserving uh, both of these sage grouse have experienced significant population declines over, the, over the, the many decades here. We are down about 90% in population and their range is roughly 50% of what it was. It still spans 11 Western states and a, a two Canadian provinces and, and it comes as 186 million acres, but sage grouse for all intents and purposes are not doing well. What's going on? Where is the primary drivers for this, this loss? We look across the range, you see things like where I live here in Montana, where we have large intact rangelands that are being converted for annual crop production. You have places like Southwest Montana or, or Wyoming, where everybody wants to take a big ranch and uh, create a ranchette so they could have 20 acres and a horse and look at the beautiful uh, mountains in their backyard. Uh, head to the Great Basin, the all too familiar uh, scenario where uh, native trees are expanding into these treeless rangelands and converting uh, habitat. To make this really short, sage grouse hate fragmentation. And it doesn't matter who causes it or what causes it. You go and look at the research and the science on every one of these major biome level threats and the impacts to populations are the same. Our, our science advisor, Dave Noggle, affectionately refers to this as this hockey stick relationship where even low densities of these fragmenting features causes precipitous declines in populations um, that, that ultimately, um, you know, affect the entire well-being of the population. Sage grouse also have, in addition to this extensive home range, they have these diverse seasonal habitat requirements. 
Every spring, they show up at these communal breeding sites called LEX or LEK, where they do the incredible show that they're so famous for. The hens then leave and they find suitable nesting cover, almost always under a sagebrush plant where they can uh, uh, have a place to raise their broods that have a lot of invertebrate and bug production close by. As summer progresses and rangelands desiccate, the they water becomes scarce and these sage grouse move their uh, they're, they're growing young to these late brood rearing areas that are oftentimes, you know, miles and miles away from where their nesting habitat is until summer comes and they're forced to find areas that they can get at sagebrush um, that's tall enough to be exposed by snow. For, for those that don't know, sage grouse are unlike any other bird where they don't have a muscular gizzard. They can't eat seeds and they rely 100% on the leaves of a sagebrush plant for winter survival. Couple this diverse seasonal habitat requirements of this bird with that extensive home range and we have a very good umbrella species to conserve the much larger sagebrush biome. All of this came to a head for NRCS in 2010. That was the date that the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, based on all of these declines, uh, made a proposal to list sage grouse um, under Endangered Species Act. Um, in 2015, because every acre of sage grouse range is essentially used by to produce sustainable livestock production, NRCS, as the agency responsible for working with these private landowners, um, really had this outsized uh, opportunity to help understand the issues and see if we could proactively do something about it. And so our Chief White uh, and, and actually Undersecretary Bonnie, it was mentioned in the previous slide, really gave us this opportunity to uh, create a new approach through NRCS that we entitled later Working Lands for Wildlife. And it was an approach that was routed in three things. Number one, it was all about removing threats that both impacted sage grouse as well as the sustainability of working lands, marrying those under the shared vision of working to achieve wildlife conservation through sustainable agriculture. Second, it was all about scale, implementing enough of the right practices in the right places to elicit population level results. And then third was our uh, was our commitment to use science in every step of the way to assess effectiveness, quantify benefits, and continually adapt our program to maximize outcomes. Our first dollar was spent hiring an independent, non-biased science advisor by the name of Dr. Dave Noggle at the University of Montana, and his charge was really to advise us on two things. One, we needed decision support tools that our staff located in all of these different counties in 11 states could use to identify the right areas that we could do conservation work. And then secondly, was to distill the incredible knowledge base uh, that's been gleaned over the decades to arrive at what are the practices we could do to make meaningful change to these populations. So our very first co-produced piece of science was development of a breeding bird density map. So if you look on the image on the left, um, Dave went to all the different states, begged, borrowed, and sealed, and pooled all of those lek counts where biologists for decades have been going to the same spots counting those birds and pooled all 11 states into one GIS analysis. And as your eyes are used to looking at thunderstorms and thunder maps, think of sage grouse populations in the same light where for the first time ever across this range, the dark spots represent high intense, high density areas where sage grouse occupy. The revelation from this first co-product science was, you know what? Although sage grouse occupy 186 million acres, they're highly concentrated in 25% of that land. If we as an agency that goes implements beneficial practices work in those heavy uh, concentrated areas, we'll benefit 500 birds instead of five. And so this was really kind of our early cuttings as far as how are we going to strategically focus these farm bill resources to maximize outcomes. This was our first piece of science. It later then led to development by partners of some broader accepted priority areas for conservation where all partners would agree to address uh, the, the different threats in, in, in the landscapes uh, together. I'd also like to point out the fact that uh, imperative to sage grouse recovery are addressing threats and those threats both require policy to address things like energy development and then other threats that take 
uh, voluntary on the ground conservation to address like this encroached tree we're gonna talk about. And as those threats are manifest over the landscape, it's not a one size for all fit, fits all uh, scenario. It's truly, we have to match the right th practice with the right threat and the right geography if we want to elicit um, positive population responses in sage grouse. And we recognize that if you roll the whole thing back, what sage grouse need are those large intact open landscapes that are stewarded by uh, America's ranchers. And so again, how can we help that community uh, achieve these, these, these resilient landscapes long-term? So I wanna talk about one particular threat as an example, uh, woodland expansion. Now woodlands have been expanding into sagebrush ranch lands for over 150 years. Think of a thousand tiny straws sucking limited moisture in this already parched environment. The new trees are out competing native plants like forbs and grasses. And they also create tall structure, structure in an environment where none previously existed. Not only does this resource concern impact wildlife like sage grouse, we're gonna show a little more on that in a second, but it also lowers the productivity of grazing operations. So solving this problem requires on the ground action surgically removing trees and instantly restoring rangelands for the benefit of both people and wildlife. So I wanna take you uh, on, the, on the map on the right is showing where NRCS through the Sage Grouse Initiative has employed on the ground conservation over this last decade to conserve, uh, restore about 617,000 acres through this targeted surgical restoration, um, all located in dark red on the map. And you'll notice by, by the position in the patterns is this is not random at all. It's highly strategic. Ranches working with neighboring ranches to conserve entire landscapes that ultimately benefit uh, sage grouse. I wanna take you now to the place where it all started. This is ground zero. This is the Warner Mountains in Southern Oregon in Northern California. This landscape is immense, not only or incredible, not only because of the, the habitats and the wildlife, but because of the amazing people. People like Todd Forbes with the Bureau of Land Management who steward about 60% of the rangeland resources and ranchers like John O'Keefe, who not only is a local longtime ranch in this community, also a past president of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, incredible conservationist. It's because of people in landscapes like this that we were able to, to really bring, I think, a magical solution for, for things like sage grouse. A couple reasons for the success there, in my opinion, they got the biology right. The very first thing that we did as an agency was try to figure out what is this issue of trees and sage grouse? How do trees impact sage grouse and how do we approach the conservation? So in our very uh, you know, first co-product piece of science associated with the trees, uh, Burdock Murdo there in Oregon led this team where they took all of the leks in Oregon and juxtaposed them on this new data set that we had that mapped the, the various tree canopy. And what she found was that sage grouse hate trees. And even in incredibly low density, one or two trees, we were having significant population level impacts of things like sage grouse. And in fact, not a single population was viable after only 4% trees on a landscape. And so what that finding did for us was said, if we're gonna go address these trees, instead of going and working where the conversions already happened, like in the lower picture and, and make a postage stamp restoration of, of, of that, let's focus on these early successional habitats first, where we still have sage grouse on the edge and let's go surgically remove those one or two trees and instantly restore tens of thousands of acres. So that was from our first, uh, first approach. And that was watershed difference, 180 from the way we used to operate, where we would get our biggest rewards by going into those forests. This completely changed our approach on how we delivered that. Number two, these folks nailed the shared vision. They recognize that if you brought the ranching community and the Bureau of Land Management and everybody together from day one and built a joint effort to restore rangelands rather than just restore sage grouse populations, you'd build a coalition of the willing that would make it happen. And so again, this is where our tagline, good for the bird, good for the herd, our shared vision continues to come to the forefront. And it was because of this that we ended up mobilizing an army of folks across public and private boundaries to actually get the work on the ground. 
instead of going from concept, bring it to reality. And so go a decade later, the proof's in the pudding. Partners in Warner Mountains have now restored 53 square miles through very targeted restoration, removing these encroached trees. Look at the pictures down below. I mean, it is a night and day difference in this landscape. Um, and on that backdrop, we've also been able to partner with scientists, incredible scientists from Oregon State University, uh, ODFW and, and others that have really rallied around figuring out, is it working? What's working? And what they found is that as soon as we cut those uh, trees and we restored those sites, sage grouse quickly colonized those in, in a couple of years where previously it was thought that it, was, it would take decades potentially for them to find restored habitat. That wasn't the case. When the hens nested, their nest success was higher, the chick survival was higher, and now a decade later, Olson's new paper in Ecosphere for the first time ever documents this population level uh, growth rate of increase of 12% in these restored areas versus control. I mean, this is, this is phenomenal stuff. This is stuff that across the entire range of sage grouse, we've never been able to quantify an increase in lambda due to uh, on the ground conservation practices. And so again, it, it, it's very uh, rewarding to see those benefits materialize after putting so much into the effort. But in addition to sage grouse, we were also able to increase water on the rangeland at the very time the lands needed it most, resulting in additional two weeks of water. This increase then led to more grass and forbs to reoccupy that lost space, which translates to 60% more forage. Now, I can tell you this outcome is incredibly important to people like John in his ranch. So much in fact, that the restoration work from this project is now enabling John to successfully pass his multi-generation ranch to the next generation. And, and since there's more than 350 other species in this habitat, it should also come as no surprise when we looked at things like other sagebrush obligates, sagebrush sparrow, brewer sparrow, green tail towhee, we, we marked another 50 to 80% increase in those populations as well. Sum it up, 12 years later using this model, we now have over 2,300 ranches actively participating. All told, it's eight and a half million acres of on the ground conservation like that Warner Mountain, you can come out and touch and feel. We've also had complete durability over that time. We've had as many ranchers participate in the run up to an ESA listing as has happened after the threat of any ESA listing. Simply put, this is not about sage grouse. This is about conserving sagebrush rangelands and grasslands. I wanna leave you with a, one link here. It's our Working Lands for Wildlife Rangeland website. We have incorporated a decade of lessons learned in both sage grouse and lesser prairie chicken into two brand new frameworks. You wanna glean information, lesson learned, you'll see our approach now focuses on two specific biomes, focuses on the big drivers of population loss. And we are just looking for uh, more and more partners to continue to keep this conservation needle moving forward. So. With that, I know we're out of time, but I, I thank you. Thanks, Tim. Yet another awesome story from a very different um, perspective. So, so thank you very much for your insights. So, uh, uh, this, this, this last picture, Sarah, I forgot. These are my two kids. Just for, just for reference, my daughter Madison is now driving. <laughs> they have Sage Grouse Initiative hats on when we started this. So this is a nice. durable effort. That's good. That's good. You got to pass it on for sure. For sure. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, and thanks for that. I, we're kind of running out of time. We have about 20 minutes. Um, we're going to go to 1210 my time, central time. Um, but I really want to jump right into this. If all the panelists, Michelle, Carol, Jeff, Tim, and Fabi could turn on their um, videos, then we can start this discussion and feel free to jump in wherever. I will just start right off the bat um, with well, one that will help, all of these will hopefully help inform road to recovery, but what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your involvement with these recovery teams um, that would inform and assist with recovery of these species on the brink? I know each story is very different, but, but what do you wish you knew that will really help to uh, inform these projects moving forward? What sort of coordination of groups or, or just what lessons did you learn that you wish you'd known? 
Well, I can, I, I can jump in. I wish I'd essentially known more about human dimensions. I wish I had known more about what was driving people's attitudes and their behavior, um, especially both during the periods of conflict and when we were trying to, to integrate things together. I really, you know, was a typical person that had my own biased view about why people were doing things. It turned out to not be accurate at all. I was constantly surprised. Yeah, that, that was gonna be my answer too. <laughs> uh, I wish, I mean, I guess I always appreciated that, uh, and, and I used to say information education, I think I probably did today too, which is kind of old school talk. Um, I wish I would have truly myself understood what human dimensions were because um, I don't think I understood that action piece, um, sort of that, that being outcome oriented when we um, originally did our uh, outreach campaigns. Um, so I, I wish I would have understood that better uh, at the beginning because I think we could have avoided some of the challenges that we faced. Um, and I wish that we would have understood how iterative that process needed to be, that it wasn't a one and done, <laughs> that you just had to uh, constantly, both internally and externally, be thinking about uh, that, that human dimensions component. So yeah, I echo what, what Jeff said. Okay. I guess I would add in there, if, I, if we could go back in time and do, you know, one of our big lessons learned, it's really that I wish we would have only focused on those big drivers of rangeland loss and degradation from day one. We spent a lot of time early on trying to understand all of these micro habitat characteristics and all of these guidelines and trying to figure out, oh, geez, on this big ranch, that's brood habitat. It needs this much grass height and this much short. I mean, it was just and it never produced any meaningful outcomes or any measurable outcome whatsoever. And so as we started to shift then and really focus on those big drivers and not treat all threats as equal, that's when we started to see the magic happen and we see the measured responses. So again, starting over, that's, and this is what you'll see baked in those frameworks is we're starting there with the big drivers of loss and degradation. It's interesting how, even though you're working in an ecosystem, all of, all of you all I, at this point with habitat are working at an ecosystem level. It's interesting how you had to start with the individual species, right? To learn those, those pieces of what to impact on that broader scale. It's, they're not mutually exclusive, I think, in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So um, an, another one is, you know, it's, it's great that you all said that that's what you wish you knew because that's, that was the point a lot of yesterday to talk about co-production and social science and human dimensions is such an integral piece. Um, so how, what are your thoughts on how do we build these protections, partnerships, implementation teams, um, and funding, honestly, um, for species that aren't yet listed? How do we set up, um, uh, like Carol or, or others, how of species who are near or, or have been delisted, how do we set that up beforehand to really drive home the importance and the gravity of these declines and really spur these folks to action without that regulation at first or, or if ever? Yeah, I think that, um, well, Tim's talk just kind of told us how. <laughs> um, and, and Jeff and I, I think lessons learned through the endangered species process, but he's doing exactly what you're asking us to mm -hmm. say, how, you know, how do we do that? Uh, and, and I also want to add that we really did learn from uh, when it came to being on the other side of, of listing and, and, and trying to function like some of these before listing groups, we really relied on some of the organizational structure and process that had been developed by some of these working groups. So um, yeah, I see a lot of um, parallels here uh, in, in terms of the strategies that, that work. And, and yeah, I mean, I think good listening is, is a really important good step and learning from each other. And I'm going to shut up and let Tim talk because I think he really, I mean, he nailed it in terms of the lessons. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I, I, I think, yeah, again, you take all the bits and pieces of all these different talks and all these different experience. And I think that the big common thread is we all need, and I love the word unbiased, right? We need this objection, you know, uh, uh, objective, non-biased science that says, if you want 
to achieve an outcome, then here's the best way to you know, make that happen as far as these type of threats need to be focused on. It stops short of being very prescriptive into saying, and here's exactly then how you need to make that happen in this local community or this state or stuff like that. And I think that's the other part about it is making sure that it is more of a broader framework and there's these different uh, tenants that, that are gonna be required, but then the decision space left to those local leaders and those communities is wide enough to allow them to take that and incorporate in their unique situation. And I think that's, again, we just keep relearning these lessons over and over. And again, I, I keep going back to our frameworks. That's where we've tried to incorporate all of that to where we have got these now these bio level frameworks that are color glossy 10 or 15 pages that don't give you any of the big detail, but it gives you all the why and the concept, but then those local leaders are saying, and here's how we're gonna make that work here, so. Yeah, I would add to that, that the importance of making local partnerships, local conservation, a big part of the effort. You need the framework from regional, national level things, but a lot of the action is gonna happen at the local level. And if you can get a few examples of how that can all work, uh, that, that can spread like wildfire. That's where you form the relationships at that local level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that issue of scale, uh, that I wrote a word down from yesterday and that was reflexivity. And yeah, I think that that's a valuable lesson in all of the talks here is that you can have those big frameworks, but you know, for us, what worked in the lower peninsula wasn't exactly what works in the upper peninsula is not exactly what works in, in Wisconsin is definitely not what works in the non-breeding uh, habitats. And so, yeah, I, I agree that some of these big pictures, uh, it's great to, to share lessons and, and then you have to build those relationships, those local relationships. I think Jeff is spot on with that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think one, one more thing to add on that comment too is, and I couldn't agree more, we have this term we call conservation envy, right? Where you have those local producers or those local partners create something magical and then you might share it at a broader scale and all of a sudden you get this, this cross state saying, well, how do I have that? Why isn't that my, or, or here, I'm going to take it up a notch, you know, and that really has been kind of a secret to our success too on that side of it is just sharing in, in having producers share with producers their own experience as opposed just to scientists and sharing with scientists and so forth. So. Hey, great. We have a, we have a question from the attendees. Um, it says both Carol and Jeff mentioned key individuals that served as bridge builders during times of conflict. Were there shared personality traits for those individuals or what characteristics might we look for or improve upon ourselves, honestly, as we begin recovery teams? How do we find the right people to help serve as unbiased arbiters to implement a conservation outcome? We all know those people we've worked with that can put up walls and make things very difficult. So how do we try and tailor these teams, working group or otherwise, moving forward to work towards recovery that really bring in the right people that work well together. Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> so it sounds very personal. Um, I mean, I'll, so I'll just put this guy in mind that, that, that Camp Grayling hired, for example, and, you know, I, I worked with him for 20 years. Um, you know, he was calm. Uh, he was competent. Uh, he was compassionate. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, th those kind of characteristics, I think, were really important. You know, when people started to get excited at re and, you know, we've had shouting matches at recovery team meetings. We've had hand, you know, hand slammed on the table kind of thing. But but um, unified mission always prevailed. Um, you know, personalities that were will, not, not in it to win an argument, but in it to be heard and to, to compromise and, and uh, ultimately work together. You know, I, those take special people. And, you know, I feel really, really fortunate uh, to, to have come out of grad school and, and landed in, in that or in graduate school to have landed in that group uh, where that, that unified mission really trumped all personality in the room. Uh, and, and, you know, things were critical. <laughs> there were 167 pairs left in the world and, uh, and, and there was that commitment. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. 
I'll shut up now. <laughs> I would say one uh, characteristic that the people that I, I've worked with had was they have a sort of a can-do attitude. Mm -hmm. Their initial response is like these other things, you know, we're going to harvest timber and we're going to hunt uh, and fish out here, but we can, no reason we can't do this too. Um, and I found you can usually tell in like a 20 minute conversation, whether someone is going to be somebody you want to work with or not. We had this one person, the reason I went to Eglin Air Force Base was a guy named Carl Petrick, which was a, for, he was a force, is still a force of nature, had that can-do attitude. And when we did the species status assessment, we called it the Carl Petrick effect because he went to three different jobs and you could, you, the population began to grow the year he got there. Uh, and he went to places where they said it's impossible here. And no, it wasn't. He just like, don't tell me who can't be done. I can do it. Well, I can do it. We can do it. I, I guess I would add to that too. Um, there's this guy named Foss that worked for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife down in that Warner Mountains project. And he was one of those, we call them spark plugs, right? He was the person in that community that generated a lot of the initial spark for this work. And, and he had this saying, and I just, I, I love it. He says, learn to say yes. Mm -hmm. And that's again, getting right at what Jeff's talking about. And he says, yeah, that's because I've asked him, that's what's your secret? How do you, you seem to do things that nobody else does. And he says, it's real simple, Tim, learn to say yes and then figure out how you're going to make it happen. And so uh, I, I think too, the other thing that we've seen is these spark plugs are incredibly hard to predict and they're incredibly diverse. And so one community, it might be like a, a, one of our local landowners or a rancher. Another, it might be a TNC professional. It might be a state game and fishing. It just doesn't, you know, it just, the unique set of circumstances arrive that create these spark plugs that then sustain that effort. And if they have a regional hub that they can feed into, it seems to be sustainable. Where they fizzle out is if they don't have anywhere to adhere to, or they'll have local success that doesn't scale up. But yeah, I think that I think one of the main um, personality traits is just not being super rigid. I feel like in a lot of your mindset, being able to compromise for sure, which is part of any good relationship, right? <laughs> Um, so we have another question. All three of these great examples have the actuality or threat of ESA listing as a club to encourage action. The hard question is still how to prompt and facilitate proactive action uh, without the immediate threat of an ESA listing. And is that just going to have to come from all of us being self-motivated and being those spark plugs to help inspire that action and we hold each other accountable or, or does that come from, from some other uh, ent entity? You know, we, we actually used um, agreements. Uh, I think those, those agreements are a very nice tool for partners to hold each other accountable. Uh, and, I, and I can say from the recent habitat shortfall, you know, I had this panic going on about, oh my God, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> and, um, and I was so impressed how the leadership of the signatories to that agreement used the agreement to leverage action and remind of commitment, <laughs> right? So I think those agreements, they, they're, um, I mean, they all have language in them that, that is escapable for the agencies, right? But it, it is that little bit of, more than just courtesy and cooperation, right? It's that that mm -hmm. thing that ties us together a little bit more strongly, even though it's it not- ties you, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yes, it ties you if there's turnover, which there's so much of right now across right. The, the field. Right. Others have thoughts? Yeah, I, I guess I would add on, on that one a little bit in that the Sage Grouse Initiative has been in existence since 2010. There was only a threat of ESA listing for the first four years. And the interesting thing, again, to note is that there was a lot of critics saying the only reason those ranchers are signing up and putting all that conservation on the ground is they're scared to death you're going to regulate them out of existence. And so the big decision on 2015 when the service said, no, we're not going to list the species, let voluntary conservation and these policies continue. We've now had, what, seven years post threat of a listing. Our numbers haven't changed at all. 
In fact, we get in more demand from ranchers than we can ever suffice every single year. And so I think there is a lot more of a, you know, the more people understand that it, it really is about conserving this biome for people and wildlife and they're part of this conservation effort. And it's not just this iconic bird over here, or whatever you want to replace. I think that's kind of the secret sauce. And I think from the outcome based science, that's the other part of, as a huge need is making sure then that we're also quantifying those other outcomes like economics, like, you know, the producer benefits like forage, all of those things, because that's what motivates a lot of those individuals to put conservation on the ground. So again, I think that the big question durability wise, if we want this to be sustained, not through a club approach, but more of a carrot, it has to be attracted to the people that don't operate those lines. Agree. Jeff, do you have any brief comments before we wrap up? Uh, looks like uh, Paul wants to wrap up. So <laughs> I actually had a last slide about money and in, 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 in the law behind it um, that I skipped. Um, sometimes you have to find other, other money, ways. Jeff, tell me about the money. Uh, sometimes you have to find other ways to, to motivate people, other reasons that people might want to do conservation. But I think there are a lot of, a lot of things out there um, in the way of various laws that, that could be used. But as Tim was saying, sometimes people... Um, people can surprise you that they're motivated to do conservation if, if you have the right kind of partnership, uh, you don't have the, the fear of regulation and all that going on. So I'm hopeful that, it, that uh, it might go better without the law behind, uh, behind you for R2R than you think. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for our presenters and our panel for the discussion. Thank you so much and go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Jeff, um, for that last comment in particular, giving us hope um, that we're on, uh, you know, on a good road, if you will, uh, to, to uh, preventing listings because we all know that uh, that's gonna cost a lot in terms of um, just agency money as well as societal costs if we send them to the endangered species list. Great presentations. I particularly love the enthusiasm for the recovery stories. And I appreciate Jeff, Carol, and Tim in particular for being willing to talk about some of the mistakes and the lessons learned uh, during their time in, in that, on that their own road. Okay, so um, again, thanks for all, all the panelists, um, Fabi and Michelle and Tim, Jeff, and Carol all did great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we now have about 50 minutes <laughs> before the next session. Please come back, all the participants, uh, attendees, and of course, the panelists um, need to come back. So we have a successful afternoon session.